Uh, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, if you would please this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll finish up, I believe, here this morning on the importance of the Bible as a foundation in our Christian lives. We've been talking about these spiritual foundations that are necessary for God's people. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There, there are foundations that God has established for our faith that must remain strong. And they're constantly under attack. There is no greater attack in the world today than the attack against the Word of God. We've expressed why that is, and, and there are many reasons, probably more than even we understand. But the, the spiritual aspect that we know is that Satan wants you to become your own God and become your own judge and determine your own way through life. That is what he attacked in the Garden of Eden with Eve and then later Adam was tempted with the same thing. God told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, and uh, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I wouldn't eat of the tree. That wouldn't be very tasty probably. But of the fruit of that tree, uh, if you've ever had bark in your mouth, you know it's a little bit bitter. So I would not, not recommend that. But don't ask me how I had bark in my mouth. I actually don't know. You know, maybe somewhere from my childhood when you're playing and climbing trees and stuff and you're like, hey, I wonder what bark tastes like. I don't know. But I know I've had a little bit in my mouth when I've been hanging tree stands and hunting and things like that. You climb in a tree and a little bit comes off the tree, it lands in your mouth and you go, wow, that's cool. Um, but they were not to eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan comes along and, and uh, in the form of a serpent and he, he, he says to Eve, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he twists the words of God. He, he gives them, as we go through that passage, we see he gives them a little truth and a little dishonesty and, and, and uh, begins to try to deceive. But he says, God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that ye shall be as gods. And so he tempted them with becoming their own gods. You get to decide what's good and evil. You get to decide what's right and wrong. And so Satan has done everything in his power to alter the words of God and try to make man his own God. And so if there is not a guiding authority in our lives, if there's not a book that is a guiding authority in our lives, uh, then we become our own judge of how things ought to go. We become our own judge of how to lead our homes, of how to be a good husband, a good wife, of, of how to be a good Christian. We become the judge of that. And one of the greatest movements of, of, of churches today, these, these massive um, non-denominational things, you know, it's amazing to me, you can't hardly decide when you roll into new towns if what you're looking at is the sign for a church or the sign for a business. We, we saw, what was the name of that business we, that was right next to the hotel we stayed in? Honey, I can't remember what it was. Um, Oh, I wish I could remember the title of it. But it was the, 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 the sign in the building looked similar to what some of these new churches look like. And so I was trying to figure out, is that a church over there? And, and you know, they, they don't say. They just, you know, they just put things on their sign like uh, the river, you know. And you're like, okay, what is it? What is the river? Is that a business? Is that a restaurant? Is that a church? What is it? I can't remember what this one was. It was the something. And we were trying to figure out if it was a church. And then when we got closer, we realized it was a marijuana dispensary. And I, I said, isn't that a sad state of things that we're, we're, in, we're in a time where you come past so many different church names that look like that. And I'm thinking, it might be a church, and it's a marijuana dispensary. Churches, it's like they're trying to do everything in their power not to identify with God, religion, or any type of identification mark for what they are. And they, they think that by doing so that they'll draw more people in. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that does work. Because people don't want to identify with God. They want to be their own God. So if they can go to a church that they can heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they can just decide what's right and wrong, and they can have smorgasbord Christianity, uh, they get to become their own God. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book. So God gave us an established word, a more sure word of prophecy. We saw that in 2 Peter chapter number 1 verses uh, verses 19 through 21 that we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. In other words, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're supposed to take heed to the book, the book that has ultimate authority 
in our lives and that this is supposed to be our guide, that this is supposed to be our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Don't tell me what you feel. Tell me what the Bible says. I don't care what your feelings are. I feel like the church ought to be this. I feel like the pastor ought to be this way. I feel like the deacons ought to be this. I feel like I ought to be able to do that. I feel like I ought to be able to dress in a bikini and still worship the Lord on Saturdays, uh, dress in a bikini and come to church on Sundays. I, I feel I ought to be able to drink all I, I want on Friday night and party until the wee hours of the morning and then get sober on Saturday and come to church on Sunday. I feel that that's okay for me to love somebody that is of the same gender. I feel like it's okay for me to be another gender. Churches are all about feelings today and there's no ultimate authority. So what does God say? That's what matters. What does God say about these things? If you're not concerned about what God says about it and if you're not concerned about obeying what God says about it, then you're not following Christianity. You're following something else. Christianity is defined in this book. Not by our feelings, but by this book. It's defined by this. And if you don't want your life to be defined by this, then you're not a Christian. How do you like them apples? You are your own God. It's not Christianity. The word Christian means Christ-like. It means that we are to be like Him. And the only way to be made after the image of His Son is through the revelation of who and what He is in this book. That's it. only way to accomplish that. This book is absolutely vital to our health. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We've gone through this over and over and over again. That's Old Testament and New. Both times that passage is used because God's people have been taught, if you are going to live according to my desires, you're going to have to follow my instructions. You're going to have to follow my teachings, my words. He told them that in the Old Testament, and he reminded, of us, reminded us of it in the New Testament. Is everybody okay? So this book is our final authority in all matters of faith and in all matters of our lives. If it's not that way, then we're not living a Christian life. We are living our own life. So let's look at it here in 2 Peter chapter number 3, and let's look at verse number 18. But grow in grace and in the what? Knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How are you going to do that? How are you going to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Well, you have a couple of options. One, you could just try to listen to the traditions of man and watch YouTube videos. You could do that. And a lot of people do that. The only knowledge they have of Jesus Christ is what they find online. That's what their knowledge of the Lord is. Today, most people get their knowledge from their phone. And they're getting their religious knowledge from their phone. And y'all, most of the time you don't know if you're reading an article from a Lutheran, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Charismatic. You don't Just because it says the name of Jesus and says the word Bible doesn't mean you ought to be reading it. Most people, they're gaining their knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the internet. They're getting it through some devotional push that they get on their devotional app. And I'm not necessarily preaching against that. I've actually told you, if... if Look, if you have a KJV Bible app, which originally was called the Authorized Version, it later became known as the King James Version for other reasons, but that's, that's neither here nor there right at this moment. But uh, if, if you are using an Authorized Version Bible app, a King James, as they call it, a King James Version Bible app today is the more common usage of the term. And by the way, when I put a Bible app on my phone, I try to delete all other versions. Because they almost always come with the KJV, the ESV, the NIV, and something else or whatever it is. I don't even want it on my phone because it's not a Bible. It's, it's, in, in most cases, they have removed so many passages and changed so many words, it is not the Word of God. Don't even want it on my phone. But anyway, um, wh where was I going with that? Um, but, but the King James Bible, oh, most people are getting their knowledge from the, from the push notifications on their phone. Nothing wrong with getting a push notification from your devotional app, as long as it's King James only. But then I don't have a clue who it is that's advising you through that little devotional you're reading. Do you know? Do you know what their background is? Do you know if they're a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, a Charismatic? Do you know? Now, you might be able to find out if they put the author's name at the bottom of the devotional. It's possible. But I don't, I don't, I don't, 
I don't, I don't need to or want to read my devotions every day and have to go search the author and find out, okay, is this person uh, worth listening to? Or are they, are they coming from, from the right form of doctrine? Or, I, don't, I don't have time for that. I'd rather just read my Bible. So here's what you do. If you get a push notification for a Bible verse to read, go open your Bible and read it. And read all the verses that come before it and all the verses that come after it that help explain that passage. And that's a good devotion. Let, let, let your Bible teach you about Jesus Christ. Don't let some man or some push notification teach you your Bible knowledge. It needs to come from, from this book. Because, y'all, I can, take, I can take any book, and so can you. We can take any book. I've used this illustration before. Um, you can take any book and make it, make it say anything you want it to. Any book. I don't care what it's about. You could be reading a book about how to cure cancer. And if it were out there, we'd all be reading it. You can take a book about how to read cancer, open a page randomly, point to a phrase, and make it say anything you want, even uh, things that would be exactly opposite of how to cure cancer. And you could show somebody that sentence in that book and say, see here, here's what it says about how to cure cancer. And you could be showing them the exact opposite thing of what they're supposed to know. Because somewhere in that book, maybe the author said something about this is not what you do, but you didn't read far enough back to find out what the context was. So you just took one sentence and says, here's what you do. You eat marshmallows every day and you'll cure cancer. Wouldn't that be wonderful? When what the author was actually saying was, we did a study and people that ate marshmallows every day for, you know, uh, for, 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 for three years developed greater cancer cells. But see right here it says in this sentence they ate marshmallows every day for three weeks. And you close your book and don't read the rest of the context, you could make it say whatever you want. I can prove to you here in this cancer book right here that it says to eat marshmallows every day for three years. That's how a lot of people are getting their knowledge from the Bible. You get one verse, you get no context, and whoever is teaching it to you is just making it say whatever they want. You don't have a clue if it's contextual or not. All right, anyway, that was a total giant rabbit trail. But, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? How are you going to do that? We have a couple options. You could get it from the Internet. You could learn it from the traditions of others. Just learn it from mom and dad. Well, this is what Jesus means to me. That's better than the Internet. But, but even mom and dad, you know, may not have everything exactly right. Your friend may not have everything exactly right. The only way for you to truly grow in knowledge of our Lord is through His book. That, that's why in John chapter number 1, the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, capital W. It's the personification of a word. It means that word represents a person, right? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, uh, and the Word was God. And then in verse number 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right? Which one of the three persons of God was made flesh and dwelt among us? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Right? That's what your Bible says. So in this book, you find Him. Charles Spurgeon used to tell preachers, every time you preach that book, it doesn't matter where it is, Old Testament or New, preach Jesus because He's on every page. This Word is Him. It's His book. It's all about Him. It all leads us to the knowledge of Him. Everything in this book is about Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? Right? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've, I've preached on that growing in grace part. We're going to move on, though. Um, let's, let's look at this. Um, where do I want to go next? I'm, I'm thumbing through the notes here to try to decide. Okay, I think, I think, uh, I think we'll go to, to the book of Hebrews. Okay, we... we we briefly referenced this last week, but I want to give it a, a little more attention here this morning. Hebrews chapter number 4. And let's look at uh, verse number 12. For the Word of God is quick, 
Now, that word quick means it's alive. It's an old English word, you know, so I know when we read these things, it's like, what does that mean? It's quick. It works quick? Well, it does sometimes, but, um, but, but it means it's alive. Now, why is it alive? Because these are the words of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is still alive, and Jesus Christ is still alive, and so we have a living, breathing book. Now, that doesn't mean that the words of this book ought to be changing because it's alive and it's breathing and we can just make it say whatever we want and we can add to it and take away from it. No, it's an established word that should not be messed with. But it's alive because the Holy Spirit makes it alive, right? When you, when you read your Bible, um, there's a difference between what you get out of the world's books, and the Lord's book. The difference is that the Holy Spirit bears witness with this book. And while you read it, He speaks to you. Now, you, you know that He speaks to you, but people say, how does He? I had one of our, our young ladies ask me out right here in this hallway, uh, whew, probably six to nine months ago. Um, one of the young ladies in the church, we were passing each other in the hallway, I think right after the Sunday morning service. People running around the hallways and kids all over the place. And, and, and so... I can't remember. My mind was focused on, on something else. I can't remember what it was, but I was coming through the door here, headed back into the auditorium, and she says, uh, she says, can I ask you a question? And it kind of shook me out of my, my, my focus there for a second. I had to wake up a little bit and realize somebody was talking to me, so I, I kind of looked up and said, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Well, what, what's your question? She said, you say sometimes that the Lord speaks to you. Like when you're preaching, sometimes you'll say, the Lord doesn't want me to say that. How do you know that? Oh, well, that was a great question. Very curious. In other words, what's the leading of the Holy Spirit sound like? This world doesn't have a clue what the leading of the Holy Spirit sounds like. They, 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 they don't have Him dwelling inside of their hearts. And, and that young lady was just trying to understand. And I used to wrestle with, it, with this when I was younger. What does the voice of the Holy Spirit sound like? Now, I know there are some preachers. Joe Boyd says that the Lord ripped the, the roof of his house off during a hurricane and uh, spoke to him audibly and told him to get right with him and get back into the ministry and, and submit to his calling. My dad traveled with Joe Boyd. I heard Joe Boyd preach summer after summer for most of the years of my growing, growing life. And, and I, I look up to Brother Boyd. I think he was, a, uh, he was a good preacher and a man that God used greatly, but every now and then you hear somebody say something, even my dad would go, yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe the Lord did speak to him out of a hurricane and he audibly heard God's voice. It's possible. Brother Boyd gave that, that story over and over and over again throughout the course of his life from his younger years through his older years. So I, I'll trust him on that. I have never audibly heard God's voice. But what I do hear is a guide into truth. And what I mean by that is that when I'm reading this book, just, just like you, I don't hear a voice in my office that speaks, Joshua Lovins, this is what I want you to preach this week. I wish it was that easy. Man, it'd also be scary, but I wish it was that easy. Um, if I was sitting in my office studying and all of a sudden I heard the voice of God, I, I imagine I'd be like all of the others in the Bible who fell on their faces dead. <laughs> You'd, my wife would probably have to come wake me up two hours later. Why is he laying on the floor? Um, but it's not that. It's not, it's not an audible voice. But you're reading this book, and there is this. We, the Bible calls it a still, small voice. There is something in your conscience that is pointing things out to you. And often they just happen to be the right thing at the right time. And you can be reading anywhere in that book. And you've read it a hundred times. And now something jumps out to you that you needed for that day at that time. And it fixes something inside of you. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, how does He speak to me up there in the, in the pulpit and things of that nature? That's, that's a different story for a different time. But in a nutshell, what I expressed to her was that God gives me a very strong desire to say something or almost puts a conviction in my heart not to say that. As I'm getting ready to, to say something, sometimes it's like I've been smitten in my heart the same way you might feel convicted when you're hearing preaching against a sin in your life. 
and God knows what's in my thoughts, and I'm getting ready to say it, and I feel smitten in my heart like you better not say that. It's like a conviction almost. That's, that's, that's the best way I can explain how I hear the voice of God in the pulpit. But it's not an audible voice. Um, but the Bible says the Word of God is quick. He's a, it's alive. It's alive because it's, it's, it, it has the Holy Spirit with it and in it and through it and speaking to us with it. For the Word of God is quick and what? Powerful. And we know it is. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, what is it sharp for? Why, has, why does God use that terminology? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of what? Soul and spirit. And of the what? Joints and marrow. And a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there's three things that are mentioned here. This, this, this sword that's sharper than any two-edged sword. What it does is it divides the soul and spirit, the spiritual side of you, the inner man, from the physical side of you, the, the flesh. So our flesh is constantly tempted to sin. That's, that, your flesh is the part of you that you still live in that is unfortunately still attached to your sin nature. Are you with me? Your spirit, the spiritual side of you that was, that was quickened and made alive when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came inside of you and He, God through His power awakened something in you that was once dead. That was your inner man, your spirit. He made you alive. And when the, 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 the Spirit of Christ came inside of you, the Bible calls Him the light of life. He, he opens your eyes and, and, and awakens you to things that you didn't see before. Helps you understand things that you didn't understand before. But He, he awakens something in you that's called your inner man, your spirit. Your spirit was once dead, now it is made alive through Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, instead of now living with a dead inner man, I'm living with a live inner man. And that there is a constant war going on between my flesh and my spirit, right? Is there a war going on inside of you? There better be. If not, you may not be saved. There should be something even deeper than just your conscience. There should be the Spirit of God inside of you that is, that is pointing out the way that the Spirit would have you to go and how that's different from the way that the flesh would have you to go. Every time your wife says something that annoys you, husbands, you know what I'm talking about. It's okay, everybody can laugh. You're telling me you've never in your life ever been annoyed by your wife. Not a one of you in here. Look at all of you guys acting like you're just total angels. You're telling me, ladies, your husband has never said one thing in your entire married lives that annoyed you a little. And the moment that that happens, and inside of you, almost the Looney Tunes almost got it right. It's like there's an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And what that is, is it's your flesh and it's your spirit. Lost people don't have that. Saved people do. Looney Tunes made a joke of it, but it really happens for saved people. The Spirit of God resurrects something in you that is a spiritual nature, and it divides your flesh from your spirit and says, now this is what you're feeling, but this is what I want you to do. And so instead of following our flesh, well, what I really want to do is just pop off and scream at her. What I really want to do is just uh, be snarky towards him. That's your flesh. The Holy Spirit will point out a Bible truth, or a truth whether you know it's Bible or not, but it will be in this book. And he'll say, now you know you shouldn't act that way. He's, he's dividing asunder. He's dividing your flesh from your spirit. And saying, now, this is what your flesh is saying. This is what I want you to do. Are you with me? This book will do the same thing. As you read it, it does the same thing. It will point things out to you in your life that it will say, now, that's your flesh. Don't do that anymore. Instead, do this. It, it performs surgery on you in the inner man. And it removes things that shouldn't be there and transplants things that should be. You get spiritual transplants every single time you read this book and the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He, he, he takes something out that's of the flesh and tries to join into your spiritual body a truth that will help you in life that is a spiritual truth that should be added to your spiritual life. So the Word of God is quick. means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. So those are the first two things that are going on. It's dividing asunder your spiritual side from your fleshly side. And then the third thing that's happening is the Bible says 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, this Bible has great discernment. And even when your wife can't get through to you, or your preacher can't get through to you, or your husband can't get through to you, if you'll read this book, it can begin to discern what is good and what is bad inside of you. And it will discern the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Nobody else can see your intentions, but the book can. <laughs> and you know, that can be both good and bad. This book can heal you sometimes when somebody misunderstand, misunderstands you, and you can be reading this book, and God will heal you because He'll say, I know this was your intention. Now here's how we respond to this, biblically speaking. But then sometimes He'll say, I know what your intention was, let's deal with this. Right? And this book is powerful, isn't it? And we need it. We saw it last week, those who seek me early shall find me in Proverbs 8, 17. We saw in, in uh, Acts chapter number 17 how some received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. They were students of the word of God. In 1876, while traveling together on a train, uh, a well-known atheist by the name of Robert Ingersoll and a general by the name of Lou Wallace decided on that train ride that Wallace should write a book dispelling the deity of Jesus and disproving the authenticity of the Bible. So Wallace agreed to it, and immediately he began to immerse himself in the life of Christ. As he poured over the pages of the Bible, he found a conviction, and this is his quote, I found a conviction amounting to absolute belief in God and the divinity of Christ. And through his study, he concluded the Bible and Christ were both absolutely true, and he became a devout Christian. General Wallace never wrote his book against the Bible, but instead he wrote what became a classic, uh, a book called Ben-Hur, The Tale of the Christ. You, you've heard of the movie and you've heard of the book, but where did it come from? It came from a man who was trying to prove that Jesus was not the Son of God. And through his research, he discovered that he was, and the Bible was absolutely true, and he was inspired to write a book exactly the opposite. That's the power of this book. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you please help us to be students of your word. Help us to, to read it and study it and know it. We pray these things as we ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, you are dismissed. We'll have church in about 10 minutes. Thanks for being here.